Well, good afternoon, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'd like to show you some of the results that my group is uh, producing recently. Uh, so Robert Thompson is, uh, was my PhD student until this January. He now moved on to Arizona to work with Romil Deve. He's sitting right there, so he's welcome to talk to him. He did a lot of work uh, on the subject that I'll show you, uh, implementation of the H2-based staff mission model. He's also doing uh, updates of our code uh, into the density independent SPH, like we just heard, uh, 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 following the uh, Hopkins 13th method. So I'll let Robert show nice movies from that work. Uh, Keita Todoroki is a graduate student at UNLV, and he's sitting over there. He's, uh, he's done uh, Agora, Agora Run 1, 2, okay? Uh, so he's going to continue that. Jason Jakes was an undergraduate at UNLV. He's also moved on to UT Austin uh, for his grad school. So my group is dispersing, <laughs> including myself. And then uh, uh, Hide Yajima uh, was also, is a graduate student at Penn State, and he's, he did a lot of radio transfer work. Uh, he's also moving on to Edinburgh uh, just recently. Okay, so motivation of my work is basically a high redshift galaxy formation and uh, realization of the universe. Okay, and uh, we have to use a cosmological simulation for this purpose. Okay, so I'll, I'll compare the uh, results from the standard, so-called standard stuff mission model versus the h 2 based model, okay, uh, and, and how that affects results like galaxy velocity function, but mass function, like uh, which the questions came up in the previous talks, uh, how the faint end slope changes based on these models, uh, how the duty cycle change, uh, and also radio transfer and scape fraction of ionized photon that's also relevant to realization. Okay? So hopefully I'll give you some hints about uh, scientific topics that we can work on in, uh, in Agora collaboration. So just to put my talk into context, uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, picture before. There's a big bang over here, present time over this side. Universe went through a uh, 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 characteristic transition from dark ages, fully neutral state, to anisic state. And as we heard from Pascal Oshir's talk earlier, observations are rapidly approaching to the first galaxies around redshift 10 or so. So the question is, what are the sources responsible for ionization? And we think it's a star forming galaxy that formed early on. And I think cosmo computational cosmologists like us is uniquely situated in this, uh, in this uh, era where we can follow this physical process of uh, making transition in the ionization and how these four, uh, sources that realize the universe has, has formed over the years. But as we all know, it's, to do that, we have to do this star formation feedback business, which is very difficult to do. And many of you know, if you look, for example, the pillars of creation in Eagle Nebula, okay, that scale, it requires us to resolve like three scales of three parsecs of the molecular clouds. And that's really still difficult to do even in the zoom-in runs that goes to 10 parsecs. And more recently, if you look at the latest Herschel results, for example, they also show even finer structure within the molecular cloud. And they, for example, show these beautiful filamental uh, structures in the molecular cloud which seems to be a 0.1 parsec thickness if you look at the condensate above 10 to the 22. So it's, and this scale seems to be related to the sonic scale where the, below which the um, interstellar turbulence becomes subsonic. So that seems to indicate the relationship to large scale turbulence that's going on in molecular cloud. And if you really want to do uh, star formation properly, we really have to resolve down to 0.1 parsec, which we still have long ways to go. So that leads us to the development of subgrid models, as we have heard. And uh, um, so that goes on like this. So it starts from the late 90s, like Yapes 97, and the seminal work by Sprengel Hernquist 03. Many of you know these models. So we regard this each particle represents two phases, hot and cold phase. And the self emission rate recipe goes like this. You know, self emission rate is simply proportional to some cold gas divided by a certain time scale. And you can develop certain models for this time scale so that you can reproduce the Kennecott law appropriately. And this normalization factor uh, uh, controls how high this curve is and how efficient the mission is. Okay. But one of the problems of this model is that it doesn't have explicit dependency on the metals, like, uh, like we see in the, in the real universe. So uh, uh, recent, recently observers are pointing out that star formation is more correlated, closely correlated with H2 rather than the simple H1. And um, for example, the Mark Krimholz's work nicely showed that the, you, you can understand this spread in terms of the metallicity dependence of the star formation. You form the dust, and then the um, dust catalyzes the, and promotes the formation of star formation. So we wanted to consider this possibility in a cosmological run. So uh, Robert worked on the implementation of the H2 density into a subgrid model, which allows us to modify the star formation law into this simpler form. So this part doesn't change. Efficiency is motivated by the observation of 1%. 
and uh, you, we now divide the de uh, age student density with the certain time scale, which is a freefall time of the age student density. Okay? So this simple modification allows us to introduce natural dependence of star formation on metallicity, and I'll let Robert talk about more details on this. Okay? I'll just point out for the relevance to the Agora project, in this model, the threshold density for star formation becomes dependent on metallicity, so above certain which, above which the star formation can uh, occur. Uh, this, so in our models, each particle, depending on its metallicity, have different threshold density to full star formation, and that may, gives us a diff, uh, 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 different amounts of stars in the, in the result. Okay, so I'm still doing a classic, traditional cosmological box simulations. We are beginning to do zooming runs as other people are doing in conjunction with the Agora project, but here I'll present the results from the classic cosmological runs like these. Uh, we use different box sizes from 10 megaparsec, 34 megaparsec, and 100 megaparsec to sample different mass ranges of the galaxies and halos. Okay, so in our best case, for example, in the 600L10, I like the traditional naming as well. Okay. Uh, in this case, we actually have co-moving one kilo, sub kilo, sub kilo parsec resolution. So if you divide by factor seven for redshift six, we get down to physical resolution of about 100 parsec at those high redshift. Okay. And so for the, for the fiducial star formation model, we moved on from spring, spring or Hernquist. We did a little bit of modification. So we now use this pressure-based model, model of the Sherry della Vecchia 08 uh, with some modification. And then these are the current fiducial model. So I'm going to contrast this model with uh, Robert's new H2 uh, star formation model. OK, so uh, we first make sure that we represent the halo mass function uh, correctly in our simulation boxes. So what we have here is a uh, uh, standard halo mass function as a function of halo mass here. Dashed line is a Sheffield Torman mass function. By using different box sizes with different uh, mass, uh, mass resolution, we allow uh, different boxes to represent different parts of the halo mass function. Therefore, we can sample from 10 to the 8 solar masses to all the way to 10 to the 12 when we try to interpret the results and, 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 and um, try to infer the cosmological implication about the, uh, uh, by these galaxies. So likewise, when you look at the galaxy stellar mass function, we can do the same. Um, so we utilize different boxes to infer different parts of the galaxy mass function. We stitch them together, form composites, stellar mass function, and try to get cosmos cosmological uh, uh, implications uh, from these simulations. So here's a result on the uh, luminosity function, mass function. So Joel asked earlier in the, in the workshop about the faint and luminosity function of galaxies. So in order to do this, you really have to do cosmological run. You cannot address these problems with the zooming runs. So when you do these, uh, you, you see that the galaxy luminosity function is very, very steep, uh, steeper than minus 2 okay, at z equals 6. And as you go to higher redshift, in fact, the slope actually becomes even steeper, closer to minus 3. So if you just, if you just focus on this panel, it shows the faint and luminosity function slope as a function of redshift, start from minus two, it goes all the way closer to minus three. And this yellow region is observationally inferred faint and slope from Bowen's group. And uh, we still, uh, uh, is a little, our, our simulation, uh, faint and slope is steeper than the observed uh, slope by delta alpha of 0.1 or 0.2. Okay, so that still needs to be seen. How does this change with the H2 star formation model? So here's what we found. We found that the bright end doesn't change very much, even with the new H H2 model. What happens is that below this certain luminosity, which corresponds to J of SD limit, uh, it, it, because we suppress the star formation in low mass halos with low metallicity, uh, the number of low mass halos, low mass galaxies actually comes down, not the halos, the galaxies come down. Therefore, there's a second turnover in the galaxy luminosity function, which gives you this additional turnover at the very low mass end. And we showed in this paper that uh, we can nicely fit these results with the modified Schechter function with additional term here, okay, which was used in the galaxy clusters uh, uh, luminosity function result earlier. But this allows us to nicely fit with additional parameter uh, that characterizes turn second turnover and then fit this uh, turnover ad additionally. Okay. And our result nicely agrees with current observation constraints with a little bit of extinction that's allowed within the observation range. Okay. And we can also do additional comparison in terms of star formation rate function instead of luminosity, which said we don't have to convert from star formation rate to luminosity. Instead, observers now convert from their luminosity to star formation rate. And that shows a beautiful agreement as well. Okay, so these are the nice uh, data from SMIT 12. And at z equals 6 and 7, we beautifully agree in this observed range. And this function also have additional turnover at the very low uh, star formation rate regime, in which we can also fit very nicely with the modified Schechter function. So uh, this provides a, a more direct comparison between simulation and observation, additionally to galaxy stellar mass function and luminosity function. Okay. 
So this is flash your results. Robert will talk about this in a little more detail, but this is the standard plot that people have been talking this week. So with our new H2 model, uh, the number of the uh, uh, low mass galaxies has been suppressed. Star formation becomes very inefficient due to low metallicity. Okay. So in our simulation, we're not doing the latest new uh, radiation pressure, uh, feedback, etc. But even without doing that, just changing the star formation model also allows us to suppress the number of low mass galaxies and bring this previous overproduction of low mass galaxies downwards to be consistent with the Peter Bruzzi's result. Okay, so this is one thing to keep in mind. Uh, we still have a, a wiggle room there, even in just the star formation model, uh, without resulting to feedback uh, models. Okay, just one point there. And also, uh, uh, this is this plot. Uh, we saw this in Shai Ganel's plot talk, specific star formation rate versus redshift. Okay, people have not shown this very much, uh, but this is a specific star formation rate of a characteristic galaxy is about 10 to 10 solar mass as a function of redshift. You take the median, plot it against function of redshift. It, we find a very consistent result between the previous result and the latest uh, H2 run result. Probably because we're looking at relatively massive galaxy and the result is not different from the previous run. And we're also consistent with the previous DAVE simulations. So among the different SPH codes, it agrees nicely. Okay. Observational data is also becoming consistent with the simulation result at high redshift. But low redshift, there might still be a big problem there uh, if you believe the Wyman result in this shown in this blue band. But of course, all of our simulations don't have aging feedback. Right? Uh, so that might change the result. But if you have the aging feedback, that could even be, even more be suppressed. The problem might become more severe. We don't know that. OK, so if you put this all of it onto the uh, cosmic star formation rate uh, density diagram, okay, this is what it looks like, about z equals 6. Uh, this pre dashed line here is a previous result from the pressure star formation model, which produced a lot of stars. Okay? As you can imagine, low mass halos contain a lot of stars. Okay, so the density rate was very high. Okay? And then we, when we switch to the H2 star formation model, then the formation of stars gets suppressed quite a bit in low mass halos. That brings down this dash curve into this blue solid line here, making it consistent with the current high Z galaxy observations, which Pascal talked about earlier. But this is from the low mass galaxies. If you look at the only the high mass galaxies, it's even below the current observed data points. Okay. So this separation is important when you look at the uh, contribution to randomization, which I'll present next. But we're now getting down to regime, getting close to redshift 12. And this curve should nicely connect to this population three studies. So people like John Wise, other people who's doing uh, ENZO or first star simulations are trying, starting to uh, simulate the transition from POP3 to POP2. We're simulating POP2 star formation there. And this should smoothly connect to POP3, POP3 star formation. Okay? So that might be able to be uh, also uh, one of the topics of the, of the Agora collaboration. Okay, so we looked at the decomposition of contribution to the total ionizing photons from different mass ranges. So um, the uh, uh, star formation rate density above z equals 6 is completely dominated by very low mass galaxies below 10 to 8 solar masses. Okay, next line here is the 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. And to, above 10 to the 9, it's very, very low. Okay, and this current observation is right there. Okay, so these current observations are only observing relatively high mass galaxies at these epochs. Therefore, if you believe these two, uh, these two lines, that's consistent observation. But if you were to include all the low mass galaxies that's not being seen currently, it will be even higher. Okay? This result didn't change very much, even when, when we switched to HGO model. So uh, uh, the uh, self emission rate limit cut off with these two limits. Uh, we can also nicely show that the current observation only observed a certain limit. And if you include all the galaxies that we simulate, it will, the true self emission rate density will be, will be a factor of 10 higher. Okay, now next couple slides I want to talk about escape fraction because this came up a little bit earlier. Okay, uh, this is related to the uh, reionization, how much ionizing photon gets out of individual galaxies. The result is quite varying, and according to previous papers, okay, there are a lot of people who have worked on this from the, uh, 2009 to present. And because they simulated different halo mass range, different epochs, they gave very different results. And the uh, result varied from 10 to minus 5 to all the way to unity. It was very confusing. And for example, John Wise showed you from Enzo results. It's also a function of time as well, very rapidly varying. So it's a function of time, space, halo mass, redshift. Okay? Uh, so all those var uh, parameter varies. So it would be nice to nail this topic down with Agora collaboration, especially maybe with the HiZ working group. Okay? 
So in order to really address this, you really have to do radiator transfer calculations. So this is what Hide did. Uh, we used his authentic ray tracing method, post-process uh, uh, simulation with uh, radiator transfer, ray tracing. So what happens is that for the massive halos like this one, 10 to the 12 solar masses, um, star-forming region shown in this yellow dots there uh, is heavily embedded into very dense gas. Therefore, it cannot escape very well. Uh, and then the escape fraction is very low, a few percent. Whereas if you look at low mass halos like this one, getting down to 10 to the 10 solar masses at redshift 3, uh, often case the star-forming region is offset slightly from the center part. Therefore, the ionizing photon finds its own way to escape into preferential direction in a conical fashion like this. And the escape fraction can be as high as a few tens of percent. So we process many, many halos for the first time uh, based on this method. And then we looked at the escape fraction as a function of halo mass. And this SPA simulation tend to show that the, the escape fraction goes down as you increase the halo mass. Okay, that is because these gases embedded highly and they cannot escape. So this result seems to be consistent among uh, SPH codes. Uh, Alex Razumov also shows something like this, or Potter Cooper also shows something like this. But the Greek code seems to suggest something a little bit different. Okay? So this is, it would be nice to show this with higher resolution with Agora collaboration. Okay, so that's one result I want to show. And then also, if you have a cosmological sample of galaxies, hundreds and thousands of galaxies, uh, you can also look at the average star formation rate history. This is difficult also to do with the zooming runs. But when you look at average over the star formation history, above the redshift 6, we see that the star formation rate increases as a function of time, very nicely characterized by exponential increase or power law. And this has a very uh, significant implication for people who model the high redshift galaxy population and compare the SEDs versus population incidence results. So uh, it's relevant for people like Pascal, how they, how they compare luminosity versus stellar mass, star formation rate. And we characterize this as a, with this exponential form. And it turns out this tau is dependent on the galaxy masses. So if you look at the high mass uh, galaxy at z equals 6, they tend to have longer tail, characterized by tau equals 200 million years. Whereas if you, like, if you look at low mass galaxies, uh, down to you know, 10 to the 7 solar masses in stars, they tend to have shorter time scale with 70 million years or so. Okay? So this can only be done with a large number of galaxies, 10,000 galaxies, few thousand galaxies. Although the average star formation rate characterized by like this, if you look at individual galaxies, even the cosmological run shows stochastic star formation history, very bursty, presumably related to the mergers and gas inflows. So on the order of uh, 10, 10 million time scales, 10 million year time scales, it does go up and down and show this bursty nature. Okay, so we wanted to characterize this duty cycle of star formation which, uh, how much fraction of time they, do they spend above the observa observa observation limit? Okay? So we characterize that by the, this duty cycle. We measure the duty cycle, uh, uh, amount of time that they spend above the observation threshold. We found, uh, what we found is that the duty cycle is, uh, makes a very characteristic transition from low mass regime to high mass regime uh, with like a step -like, stepwise function like this. So 10 to the 7, almost zero duty cycle there. And uh, as you go to high mass, they're almost always forming stars. Therefore, the duty cycle is always close to 1. Okay, so this, this transition can be fit very nicely with sigmoid function. And that we characterize as half mass point and, and how, how, well, how fast it makes this transition. This is also a good test for JWST. And I'd like to confirm this better with the zooming runs in the future. Okay. So I just wanted to point out, last few minutes, uh, Keita has prepared a nice uh, website for Agora collaboration. So when he did uh, round one and round two, he summarized all these results from Gadget 3 results, all the images. Snapshot is available from his website. Uh, so you're welcome to look at that. He also prepared a nice summary PDF file, which I hopefully some of you have looked at already. It's linked from the Agora website. So I welcome, uh, I encourage you to look at it if you're interested. So we compare, we did a series of runs. Uh, with and without, the, uh, for example, the PM switch, uh, how, whether you use a 3 PM or, or just stick with PM. Uh, it does have some implications on the runtime, the accuracy of the forces, and such. So he shows comparison of different groups, uh, documented uh, profiles, inner part, outer part. He also shows nice comparison of the images. Okay? So all of them, all of them in one place. So here's my conclusion. I'll just mention all these. Uh, I just mentioned that it's, it'll be good to continue the comparison between cosmological simulations versus the zooming runs, use the same condition, and see how well the cosmological run compare with the zooming runs that allow us to continue to check the validity of the cosmological runs and also address the, uh, topics like uh, realization at the same time. Okay? 
So I'll also point out that Robert will show a nice comparison of classic SPH and also density independent SPH. Uh, so I look forward to hearing his talk tomorrow. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Yes. Uh, pointed out that uh, in their new data, which now goes out to rich hips 9 and 10, uh, they're seeing a further steepening of uh, the faint end uh, of yes. the mm -hmm. uh, luminosity function now to minus 2. So even better agreement with uh, your simulation. Yes, uh, yes. Now, something that uh, was included in simulation in, in Daniel Severino's uh, PhD dissertation with Anatoly was the point that O stars actually are frequently ejected from their birth cloud. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, something like a third of them yes. are seen yes. Yes, traveling I'm with velocities of mm -hmm. 10 or more kilometers a second. Yes, yes. Is enough during their lifetimes to get them uh, 10 or even 20. Uh, yes, yes, I know that work, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they aren't necessarily going to be embedded in these dense uh, regions. Yes. That will absorb lots of their sure, sure, radiation. sure, sure. Uh, you didn't mention, although you're shaking your head yes, that you included that effect in the simulation. No, I did so not. You pointed out mm -hmm. to be relevant uh, uh, to reionization by Charlie Conway last year. Probably, probably is relevant, yes. Although, although our simulation did not include that process explicitly, if we, if we had implemented it, it would be even more efficient for the escape fraction. It would enhance the escape fraction. Right. But they only do, do a few times of parser. That's right. So unless you have that type of resolution. But for low mass yeah. halos, especially, yeah, it'd be. The solution, what you have to do is not assume that they all have their ionizing radiation absorbed nearby by dense gas. Uh, I mean, you can fake it, as we always do, to mm -hmm. get the subgrid uh, right. Uh, so, yeah, but I mean, obviously, if you have that resolution, ray great, but if you don't, you, you still have to, you ought to fake that. Yeah. One problem with this ray tracing result is that um, the, the radiative transfer is even more expensive than the simulation sure. itself. Therefore, when you try to do radiative transfer, you have to actually degrade the hydro resolution to match it to radiative transfer. So we want to do even higher resolution radiative transfer, but right now it's impossible to do it. So we're not limited by the, actually the hydro resolution. We're actually limited by the radiative transfer resolution, in fact, yeah. And just a quick comment. Uh, you said that you know, H2 helps because it has quenched star formation in the works. And I agree with that. We've done uh, similar uh, simulation with H2 regulated star yes. formation. But again, as I showed in my talk, if instead you use uh, simply gas, you have no atomic to molecular transition, but you put your threshold for star formation very high anyway, mm -hmm. you get basically the same. Similar effect. result, yes. So it depends on the threshold, yes. Yeah. I agree that the threshold is a very important parameter for star formation. So, so one question I have is what? With H2, you don't have to put a threshold by hand. You ju just have the fraction of H2. But I'm just saying that if you run the same simulation without H2 and a high star formation threshold, you're going to quench star formation in the warps in the mm -hmm. same way that you do with mm -hmm. H2 regulation.